Um, so uh, it's my great pleasure on behalf of the Bloomberg uh, Library Committee to have our librarians here today to give us an update about using the Eccles Health Sciences Library resources and uh, to uh, really tell you about our efforts in the Moran Core, um, which is our new educational website. And here to talk about that are two amazing librarians. Uh, the first is Christy Jarvis, who has a master's degree in library science from San Jose State University. And she's been with Eccles Health Sciences Library since 2011. And we've worked with her on our library committee for uh, many years. Uh, and uh, she's been helping us with all the journals. She's the person who orders all the journals and ebooks and other e-resources. And she's going to give us an update on, on the library. And then I'm going to introduce Nancy because she's going to kind of tag team in here. Nancy Lombardo is um, also from the Eccles Health Sciences Library. And um, she's the systems librarian. And she received her degree from Emporia State University. Uh, and she's worked in many, many different places. If you want to know about the Intermountain region of the National Park Service, Nancy has been uh, an employee there. She also is at Dartmouth College and University of New Mexico. Uh, but we know her as a librarian, a health sciences librarian extraordinaire. And as you know, she is the librarian that I worked with when I did my book, uh, Practical Viewing of the Optic Disc. And she's also the librarian who um, really founded the North American uh, neuro-ophthalmology novel library, neuro-ophthalmology virtual educational library, and we are so lucky that we could work with her on uh, establishing the Moran uh, core. So I'm going to introduce Christy first, who's going to give us a quick and dirty library overview, followed by um, a very exciting presentation about the Moran core. Okay, Christy. So it's going to be quick and dirty because that's all we have time for. Um, I gave a presentation somewhat similar to this to the new residents and fellows a couple weeks ago. And since they are new and overwhelmed, they have a tsunami of information. Um, I only asked them to remember three things. But you all, most of you have been around longer, so I felt like you could up your game. And I'm giving you four. <laughs> so uh, you're on notice. You've been challenged. So the four things that I want to review that are important that I think to help all of the researchers and faculty and staff to make use of library resources is how to find full text from PubMed, what your full text options are when the library does not subscribe to something, how you access library resources when you are off campus or you know, in your mountain home or vacationing in Bermuda and you desperately need to get into a journal. And then I want to highlight just a couple of new resources that the library has added in the last year or so that you may not be aware of. So full text in PubMed, the single most important thing to know is do not go to PubMed.gov. Um, PubMed.gov is open to the public and all you will find in there is free full text resources. Um, the University of Utah has a special PubMed instance that includes links to all of the journals that are subscribed to and you want to make sure you are using that instance of PubMed. Um, there's a couple ways you can get to it. You can use that URL, you can bookmark it, or you can find it on the Eccles Library website that the PubMed link will open this. You'll notice up in the URL that it says OTool equals Utah Lib. That's the outside tool in PubMed using the University of Utah Library Resources. Um, and I'll point out in a minute how you can make sure you are using that. Um, so you can either use that website or do I have people here who are my NCBI users? Anyone here that? Logs in. Okay, so if you are accessing PubMed and you're, you're using your My NCBI account, you will want to make sure your My NCBI account is updated with this University of Utah Library outside tool. Um, you just need to log into your My NCBI preferences. Um, there's a section under PubMed preferences where you want to select outside tool, and then there's a, just a long list of institutions. Find the Eccles Health Sciences Library and select that, and then save. Then anytime you log in with your My NCBI account, you will be using the University of Utah's PubMed instance. Um, so here is from the library's website under the Quick Links box. That PubMed link will open the university's instance of PubMed. So that's one way you can find it. So how you will know that you are using the University of Utah's PubMed instance is that every single abstract that you look at in PubMed will have that fine, little swirly icon, find it button. 
next to every single abstract. Um, many of you may be familiar with this icon that's down here on the bottom. That is an icon that we used to be able to put in PubMed only on abstracts that we had full text for, which seems like a really great idea, except it's only about 60% accurate. We were only ever able to put that icon on about 60% of the resources we have because other things that we had access to, PubMed did not give us an option to put this tool on, this icon on. So while that icon was nice and slick and when you clicked on it, it just opened the PDF, you were really only getting access to about 60% of what the university really subscribes to. So we did away with that, so you won't be seeing that icon in, in PubMed anymore. And like I said, it used to be only on things that we had full text to. Now that find it icon is on every single abstract. So if you're in PubMed and you're looking at an abstract and you don't see it, you are not using the University of Utah's instance of PubMed. And you'll want to back out and use that link from the library website or that bookmarked URL. So when you find the abstract you're interested in and you click on that find it button, here's what happens. You leave PubMed and you come into the University of Utah library catalog and there's the article information that you were looking at and you get this, well if you're lucky, you get that little green button. Green means go. Green says full text is available for this article. And then underneath that you see a list of the platforms that that article is available in full text on. In this case it's on several different Elsevier platforms. Pick your favorite, um, click on it and it will actually from there open the full text article. So this process involves one more click than the old, old icon did, but it's significantly more accurate in finding the full text that you're looking for. So in PubMed, you clicked on that full text icon, it brought you here. This article we have full text for, so clicking on any of those links will give you the full text. Here's an example of finding an abstract in PubMed, clicking on find it, coming into the library, and instead of that green um, dot that says, oh, we have it, you get a yellow dot that says check availability and it says no full text available. That means the library does not subscribe all the way back to 1991 for the American Journal of Ophthalmology. So there's no online full text access to this article. So no full text available means we don't subscribe to it. Underneath where it says additional services, there is a link that says request an article. So what do you think request an article does? So someone says it charges you. So this is how you launch interlibrary loan. So if the library does not subscribe to something and you want to read this article, click on that request an article link. The first thing that will pop up is a box asking you to identify which library you are affiliated with. You want to select the Eccles Health Sciences Library. From there, you will be taken into ILLiad, which is the interlibrary loan tool for the universities, or for the university libraries. You have to have a separate Iliad account to order articles through interlibrary loan. It's not the same thing as your unit and password. Um, I'm about to show me logging into Iliad and I made my unit my username, but my password is not my CIS password. You have to register separately for an Iliad account. Once you have logged into your Iliad account, you will see the order form open and because I came in through PubMed, it brought over into the order form all of the article citation information that I want to order so you don't have to manually enter it in, verify it's all correct, and then you submit it. So how many people here have ordered an article through interlibrary loan? Couple, couple, okay. Did you like it? Yeah. Be honest with me. No, it's really like after they type all this stuff. Did you come in through PubMed? Oh, it, it, should, it should populate all those fields for you. So the most common complaint I hear from people all about why they don't like interlibrary loan is because it costs money, right? Um, so the libraries for many years have, subs have completely subsidized interlibrary loan for students. Um, it was paid for out of student funds. Um, but the library has only been partially subsidizing interlibrary loan for faculty and staff. Um, so you were being charged $9 every time you ordered an article through interlibrary loan. The library was paying the copyright fee, um, so was partially subsidizing it, but the requester was being asked to chip in money. Um, as of about two or three weeks ago, that is no longer the case. You will not be charged, 
You will be charged zero dollars um, if you request an article through interlibrary loan. So it will not cost you anything. Interlibrary loan tends to get the article to you in about 24 hours. It's um, sometimes less than that, but that's about how long it takes. If you currently have an Iliad account and when you registered you had to put in a credit card number, you don't have to go into your account and remove that. It's just any orders you place now, it's not going to charge you for anything. Um, like I said, this is so new that if you go back on the interlibrary loan page, it still says fees apply, tell me more. Like we haven't even gotten to the point of that, that message will go away, um, but it is that new. But if you register for an Iliad account today, there is still a field where it's gonna ask you to put in payment information. You have to put in something to be able to register yourself, so just put in the words no charge and you can continue registering. Um, and like I said, if you already have a chart field or a credit card number in your Iliad account and you, you placed an interlibrary loan order tomorrow, you're just not gonna be charged. It won't, it won't go through as a charge. So um, hope that this really encourages people not to um, tear their hair out when they get to that final screen where they see, oh, no full text available, crap. What am I going to do? Um, I have to order it. At least know that ordering it, you should get it in about 24 hours and it won't cost you anything. So that is a new option for getting full text. It's not a new option. It's a new free to you option to get full text for articles. Um, so that's a no, that's dollars floating away. Um, okay, remote, remote access I want to just touch on briefly because um, People that do work primarily on campus tend to not have to think about, oh, how, how am I letting the publisher of this journal know that I'm affiliated with the University of Utah and should have access? You don't have to worry about it because all of our access is IP authenticated. So as long as you are within the IP space of the university, the publisher knows, oh, this person should have access. And you don't have to do anything. You just get in. But when you're working at home in the middle of the night or, like I said, working on your vacation in the Bahamas, you need to have some way of letting Elsevier, of letting Wiley know, I work at the University of Utah and I have a right to access these journals because they're being paid for. So the way you authenticate yourself is by using the university's proxy server. Um, so on the library's homepage, there are multiple buttons that do the same thing, but any of those links that say off-campus access, when you click on it, it's going to prompt you for your university ID and password and then take you right back to the page that you were on, but now, up in the URL bar, you will notice that you are being identified as part of the, you are, have come in through the proxy server. And now when you navigate to a publisher's website, that proxy server information comes over and Elsevier and Wiley and Springer know, oh, this person is actually a member of the University of Utah and they subscribe to this journal and that journal, so go ahead, have at it. Um, so if you find yourself working from home and you're trying to, you know, you Google a title of a journal and it pulls up the journal site and you're like, why can I not get into Lancet? Of course we have Lancet. Well, realize you never identified who you are to that publisher, so they don't know, let, they don't know to let you in. So that's for remote access. And then a couple of new resources that I just want to point out. Um, Embase is fairly new to the library. Um, Embase is a terrific tool to use if you are doing any type of systematic review or just thorough searching of the literature. Um, Embase has some overlap with Medline, but it has a significant amount of unique content. Several thousand journals that are not indexed in Medline are in Embase. Embase is very strong in um, gray literature and conference proceedings, particularly strong in drug, and one of the best sources for international, particularly European journals. So it's another great tool to search um, when you are trying to oh, you really... So all of these tools that I am going to mention are accessible. Right here on the library's homepage is a tab that says Research Databases. You can, there's an A to Z list. So click on Research Databases and then the title, the letter of the title and it will drop you down. It's just an A to Z list of all of these tools. Um, so Embase is a fairly new tool to make use of. Clinical Key is pretty amazing. Um, Many of you may have used MD Consult in the past. Clinical Key is what MD Consult used to be before it started pounding steroids. It is now, um, everything that used to be in MD Consult is in Clinical Key, but there are an additional 500 journals, 1,200 medical and surgical books, 13,000 um, videos, and almost 4 million images. 
So I tell people, if you are looking for an image to put into some lecture or presentation, check clinical key first. The odds of them not having it is pretty slim. Um, and they are all medical, Im well, they're images. Some of them are photographs. There are charts and graphs and diagrams and drawings. Um, but a lot of, of image material. And one of the really nice things is that all of the images that are in Clinical Key, they are licensed for reuse for education. So you don't have to worry about getting permissions or anything like that. You can just download the image from Clinical Key into a PowerPoint. It'll come with the citation information, and you don't have to worry about getting permission. It's already been granted through the university's license. So Clinical Key is worth, and here I just did a, I went into Clinical Key searched just multimedia for closed angle glaucoma, got 200 images. You can see some of them are photographs. There are graphs and charts. Um, you know, four million images, you'll probably come up with something that works, <laughs> that works for your presentation. So I highly recommend checking out Clinical Key if you have not. Um, and then lastly, there are two imaging centers from Amersys, which is a company some of you may know of or have heard about because it actually grew out of the University of Utah pathology department, I believe, um, is who started it. Um, but the university has purchased the refer Imaging Reference Center and the Pathology Reference Center. And these are image libraries um, where you can look up information. They're meant for non-radiologists and non-pathologists. But the idea is, is that you can get imaging that supports a diagnosis. So this is an example of something in the Imaging Reference Center uh, on optic neuritis, where you get um, radiographic images, sometimes it's CT, ultrasound, x-ray, whatever is appropriate for the diagnosis, images you can look at, and then there is corresponding clinical text, um, you know, when you might want to recommend a certain type of imaging study for a particular diagnosis. Um, the Pathology Reference Center is very similar, but it's results of biopsies and, you know, other types of, of cultures. Um, in all areas of diagnostic pathology. So you can look up, um, here's a particular type of condition. I don't know what this is, but these are some of the slides um, that would accompany a, a diagnosis. There's often slides of what a, a, a normal result versus an abnormal result would look like. And again, it comes with clinical text. And if you scroll down to the bottom, there's references for all of the explanatory text that goes along with the images. So those are Really, between Clinical Key and the Pathology and Imaging Reference Center, you have a vast library of images. Um, Clinical Key also has audio-visual presentations. Um, so I encourage you to check those out. There are a lot of resources that you can make use of. And finally, I just want to throw up here how you get help. Um, there are many ways to contact the library, chat, email, phone, um, library hours. The Bloomberg Library is open 24 hours. Um, Echoes Library is normally open 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. Any quick questions? It's like that imaging, those are also licensed for reuse? Yes, they absolutely are. And one of the nice things about all of those is when you download an image into a PowerPoint, it comes with at least a snippet of explanatory text of what the image is, where it came from, and what it's purporting to show. So yes, they are all available. You can print, email, download, save, share. Anything else? Yes, you can if, if you, uh, uh, yes, so the question was, do you have to go through the proxy server if you are accessing remotely or can you use VPN? You can absolutely use VPN. Um, there are a handful of publishers. They don't tend to be the large ones. Some of these smaller publishers occasionally have trouble recognizing you through VPN. Um, so if, if it's something that you suspect that the university has access to and you are using VPN and you're not getting access, try going through the proxy server. But if you're a VPN user, it, yes, that will work as well. The virtual private network, which you can connect to the VPN and then your machine's IP should, you, should mirror something within the university's network. <laughs> yeah, so you can. That's, that's kind of, you can take that one offline. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you afterwards. Yeah, there is. It's, I mean, there's a, a web version, there's a client version, but it, yeah, it's doable. No other questions? Off to you. Thank you.
Okay, so I'm Nancy Lombardo, and I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about the Moran Core, which is the new educational website, Clinical Ophthalmology Resources for Education. Uh, this is a collaboration between the Moran Eye Center and the Eccles Health Sciences Library. We're building a digital library of educational materials that are produced here by the faculty, fel fellows, residents, and students. And the goal is to support teaching at the Moran as well as uh, teaching at the international programs. It's publicly accessible, um, and we're going to be highlighting all the excellent work that is done here at the Moran. Um, the goal is to provide high-quality peer-reviewed materials, so we do have an editorial board. And any materials that are accepted into the core will be considered peer-reviewed publications and can be cited on your CV. And some of you have already participated. And uh, this is what the website looks like. At the end, if we have time, I will go and do a live demonstration, but for now, we'll just uh, sort of review it as it um, on these screenshots. So this is the, the front end, and you can see we have buttons specifically going to the grand rounds, the resident lectures, surgery videos, and then we have a mem menu, and the menu is designed uh, loosely based on the AAO BCSC outline, the books, um, and so material are linked and displayed directly in the website. And when you are submitting, we do want to know a specific category because we're trying to organize it based on these topics um, as they're organized in the menus. So the menus are sort of a collapsing menu structure. So when you go into the site, for example, if you go to neuro-ophthalmology, decreased vision, you can see there's a little sub-menu. And the category for these three videos that exist is examination. So when submitting, we are asking for that information, and so if you can be as specific as possible, an item can be linked in more than one category. If that's appropriate, that's fine. Um, as far as publications, we are gonna be capturing, and Ethan, you've probably seen this magical cart that Ethan is using uh, to capture the grand rounds and the resident lectures, and those will all go be categorized and added to the Moran Core um, automatically and all of our video is hosted on YouTube but our YouTube channel is an unpublished site which just means you cannot search YouTube directly to find the videos um, you have to come into the to the core you can also find them through Google but it will bring you into the core rather than directly into YouTube so um, you should think about submitting work that you are required to do already if you're presenting at the F&A conference or the Orbit conference, other conferences, lectures, meeting presentations. If you do a really great presentation or present a really great case, think about submitting that to the core and we'll have it reviewed and you'll um, get an acceptance letter and you'll be able to cite that as a publication in an online educational resource. Um, all the medical students doing rotations at the Moran are going to be doing at least one image report or case report, and it will be peer-reviewed and then added to the core collection. For faculty and residents, um, we're collecting case reports, image reports, presentations, videos. We've been getting a lot of surgical videos. They're, um, that's a really faster growing section of the site. We have templates available so that you can just fill out the template. It's all very structured and you just fill in the template and submit it with your material so that we can add it to the site. Um, attending physicians can review the draft before you submit it. Here's the email address to which you submit any case that you want to add to the core. If your materials are too big, sometimes the videos are too large to send through email and we can arrange to submit them through Box, or you can use Sendit, which is the university's um, tool for sending large files. Anyway, if you just send email to this address, I will get it and we can figure out how to get the material into the core. Um, we do have a guidelines for author uh, document on the site, so you should um, take care to look through this. It's basically um, instructions for submitting and reminding you about PHI, if you have patients represented in the video or presentation that you're submitting, it's your responsibility to be sure that you have permission to use that in, the, in, a, in a public 
publicly accessible educational site. Um, do not use copyrighted material in your PowerPoint. And, and Christy, this is a question. So if they download an image from Clinical Key and use it in their presentation, can they submit that to CORE and that's okay? Or? Yes, site where it came from, but you don't have to have permission. Okay, so that's great. That. So that is really great so that if you are using any of those fabulous imaging resources that Christy just showed and you download those and put them in your presentation, those are acceptable. So, so that's a really good thing to know and that will help a lot. Um, but in general, if you're using, say, if you're citing or referring to a table from a published scholarly journal, do not copy and paste the table into your presentation because that is, um, that is violating copyright. So what you should do is summarize the table and then cite the, t the article. So it's okay to refer to the information, you just cannot copy the table directly and put it into your, into your presentation. And, and that goes for the same with images that come directly out of scholarly journal. Um, so you have to be careful. We do want to be careful about copyright. We don't want to be violating copyright. And um, music in your, in your video, try not to use any copyrighted music or audio. We do have one grand round presentation that has Star Wars music in the background and YouTube identifies that and, and uh, tags that. And now that particular grand rounds is um, susceptible to advertising. So Sony owns that music and they can start putting advertisements every time somebody watches that particular grand rounds. And so, it's amazing that they can just scan through and identify exactly the music that is copyrighted. So be very careful with that. Um, at this point, we are leaving that grand rounds up and we'll see how much advertising really um, occurs. And if there's a lot of advertising, we might have to take it down and try and um, mute the audio. Unfortunately, the speaker is speaking over, the music is in the background, so it's very difficult to edit that out. Um, okay, so. The student assignments, there are instructions on the website that outline step by step what the students are required to do. Each medical student will be asked to do an image report or they can choose to um, do a case report. And they'll work with their resident or faculty and they will use the template, the same template that faculty and, and residents are using and they will be required to have their faculty review that report and sign off on it and then they will submit it to the medical student educational coordinator who is Chandler. So that will be taking place. So as residents or fellows or faculty, you may have students asking you for help or guidance on those reports. These are what the image, what the templates look like and these are available on the website. They're all linked there. But it's basically you just fill in the, cat, the, the information on the form please do provide that category to the third level if possible. There's a link directly to the site on the template so that you can look through and decide where you want your, your submission to be placed in the menus. So there's an image report, there's a case report, there's a video template. They're all very similar. We have recruited uh, an editorial board and you can see that we have um, some very prominent faculty helping us with this editorial review and if you believe that you um, have would be able to provide editorial support for us we are accepting volunteers the more the merrier that just divides up the work so uh, the editors will be asked when submissions come in that are in their topic area we will ask them to review those materials or assign the review to one of their colleagues as far as copyrights, we just uh, sort of went through this, but you can, um, oh, when you submit, you retain all the copyrights to your material. So this is not in any way like some of the scholarly um, publishers who want you to sign over your copyrights. Anything you submit to the core, you're giving us permission to publish it, but then you can take it and reuse it and do whatever you want with it. You can publish it other places. That's absolutely fine. It, you own the copyrights. Uh, just remember that you don't want to use other copyrighted material in your publication because we'll have to edit that out or it, it will be rejected. Uh, here are some sample, 
Here are some samples that have been submitted. Just to give you an idea, so this is live, this is the actual site, and this is an image report that was done by um, Eileen. And uh, you can see there's the image, and here's all of the metadata information. And then this is actually, the, the site is live. And I need my glasses to see it. Um, and you can see this is, um, the menus are all collapsible. You can go into the items, you just maneuver around. It is also searchable. Um, the videos play right off of YouTube, but they're embedded in the site. Here are the guidelines for authors. And here are the student assignment instructions. And uh, in the about core, there's a brief description. And these are the people who have participated in the production of it. And let's see if I can get back to, can see this. Yes. And so, oops. Is this thing? Okay, so we also are developing a separate but related international curriculum, and we've been working with Lloyd Williams, and this has a, a unique structure. It's very similar, but not exactly the same, and the materials that come into the core that are submitted to the core are also evaluated and then tagged and added to the international outline as appropriate. This is based on an East, South, Central African outline that's been designed um, and can be used. It's, it's also open, publicly accessible, can be used by any international site. And it's got a slightly different um, structure based on the, the curriculum that they're using. So um, you'll see materials linked in both places and either, either outline can be used to access the materials um, and even though we have not promoted this or advertised the site at all, we already are having users and we've been um, using Google Analytics to capture usage statistics starting in October. And you can see we already have had uh, 3,600 sessions, 2,000 users, 19,000 page views from 99 different countries. And it's interesting that 56% of our visitors are new visitors, so people are finding it, and they're finding it by searching Google. They'll search a topic in Google, and it will bring them into the core. And so that's, that's how we're getting our users. YouTube, we've had 6,121 minutes, four days and six hours, so 1,600 views of the videos. So these, these things are being found in this year. So the first year, or last year, the the main goal was to get the structure up, get the website in place, which we have done. And this year, we're really going to be focusing on building the content and filling in the outline. And so we're going to, hoping that you'll all help us with that by submitting your great cases. And uh, we will start promoting it. We're going to be working with marketing at the Moran. Yes? So if we're working with an international program, we want them to be able to access it more directly. What is the best way for them to you can just give them the URL, Moran, right now the URL is morancore.med.utah.edu. Okay. And then they, it's all freely, openly accessible. They could start using it right now. And, and there are, as I know, uh, 99 countries have accessed the site so far. So, so yes, you can start directing them to it. The international outline is just starting to be populated, so if you do send the URL, you might note that this is something that's you know under construction. We're in the building of the content now. And uh, I just want to acknowledge the Bloomberg Library Committee that has been so instrumental in getting the site set up and to the point that it is, and then my little library team who have uh, done all of this uh, work getting this website online. Can, can you go back to the main thing and to the site. Show the ophthalmic video or yes. surgery videos um, area. Okay. Sure. Okay. This is the live site. <laughs> yes. So we have, if you, on the home page, 
Um, we highlight the surgery videos here in this, with this button, but we also have a section with an organi organizational structure just for ophthalmic video. Um, but if you wanna see what's new, these buttons are really helpful because they will display everything in that category and they're displayed in chronological order as far as when things were added most recently. So these are the newest videos and if you scroll down, you'll see it's just a long list of, of the video submissions that we've gotten. And if you want to view one, you just click on play and you can watch the, the video. So, so that is the easiest way to get to them using this button. Um, over time, we hope to fill out this whole outline and uh, it also is, they all work the same way where it's a collapsible menu structure and it can take you into them guided in organizationally by the topics. So, any other questions? Yes? So the question is, um, would articles that would be available on PubMed be included in the Moran Corps? I don't think that we will have journal articles per se. Now, in the templates that we uh, have submitters fill out, there is a place for you to put references and we could link directly to the PubMed article from the references. So there could be a link to an article, but I don't see us republishing articles that have been published elsewhere. No, this is actually not what I mean. Oh. Um, so, so what I mean is if somebody puts an article that they were in here to Moran onto Moran or um, could, could that article or in the future you anticipate linking the Moran or to PubMed so that those articles could be Oh, okay, would, would material in the Moran core be accessible in PubMed. Um, we can look, we will investigate that possibility. I think if we get the content developed substantially, there is a possibility that PubMed would index this tool. They, they do index um, some electronic books and other tools of that sort, but I think that we, we will have to do um, maybe at the end of this year after we've done quite a bit more content development, that's a possibility. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you.